Hey Bengals, today we're going to be looking at the trends across the periodic table and talk about how the table is organized, um, how you can determine properties of an element based on its location on the periodic table. So let's get started. On your Wix page, there's a few questions, so we kind of pre-printed it for you. Um, the questions that we talk about are already printed on the front side and then you'll have a blank periodic table on the back side. As we go through this there's going to be several steps that I need you to complete on the periodic table. Um, to start out with I want to address the first question that you have on your Wix page and that is how is the periodic table organized and what is it? So the periodic table is the collection of all of the elements that have ever been discovered and they are arranged across the periodic table according to certain characteristics and as we talk about each of the category I'll explain each of those characteristics and how they pertain to the element. Um, the periodic table was originally put together by Dmitry Mendeleev and um, he noticed several of these patterns that we're going to be talking about and he used those patterns to develop the periodic table to keep them organized and to notice the trends and the char similar characteristics that we'll find. In your first action item, uh, you'll notice on the slide it says on your paper, label the 18 columns and the 7 rows and name them families, periods, families and periods. So uh, when we talk about families, you'll see it written one of two different ways. You'll see it written as families or you'll see it written as groups. Periods though are always going to be called periods. So the families are the vertical columns. They move up and down. And then periods are the horizontal rows. They go across the periodic table. Sorry that arrow is not so great. Um, so as we talk about one, when we talk about an element's address, Okay, we might say an element in family 14, which is way over here, and then period 3, well, if you go to that address, family 14, period 3 is this element right here. So whatever element would be in that location would be the one referred to by that address. So families on the periodic table. The reason why they're put into columns as families is that they have the same number of valence electrons, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then periods are arranged because they have the same number of energy levels or rings on their Bohr model. So if you have an element that has two rings, it belongs on the second period of the periodic table. Um, and then this would be the nucleus inside of the atom. So a couple more of the trends that we see on the periodic table. We have at, um, atomic mass or the, the mass of the atom will increase as you move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. So go ahead and draw this arrow that you see at the top of the table um, and label it atom mass increases. Another one is the atom size, its volume or how big it is will increase as you move down the periodic table. So the element in uh, period one, family one, is going to have uh, the smallest mass and the smallest size. And then if you go all the way down here, this is where you're going to get into the larger mass and the larger size. So as we look at the different families that are on the periodic table, um, different families have different names. And the first family that I want to talk about is the alkali family. So go ahead and label the first family, um, the first column on your periodic table, the alkali family. Now, the alkali family is, includes elements like lithium, sodium, potassium, and these are elements that are um, truly metals. They have one valence electron. And because of that one valence electron, this is a highly, highly reactive family. Um, so much so that they even react with water. And I want to show you 
a video here about how these elements, how these metals will react in water. So check this out. Whether you've left school or you're still at school, you can appreciate the sheer fun and mayhem that chemistry can be. There's so much to it. Bunsen burners, mixing chemicals. Very nice. Now, you may have been allowed to mix very small amounts of lithium with water. You may, if with a responsible adult, have mixed H2O with sodium. And you may, under very strict scientific control, have witnessed potassium mixed with water. But the odds are, if you have, it will only ever have been on one of those rubbish science videos. There you go, mate. Present. Oh, thank you very much. Mix these babies with water, stand well back, and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr. Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right up, I'm off. Have that. OK. Good luck. OK, Tickle, drop the rubidium in the water. Stand back, everybody, this one's going to be bad. Our two grams of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. That is more like it. Only on Brainiac do you get that kind of science. But I believe we can go one better. There is one more alkali metal we can legally use. Yes, Richard, cesium, the emperor of alkali metals, particularly nasty, could go off at any time. And that's it? Oh, yes. Brilliant. I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? Imagine a depth charge in a bathtub. Fair enough, mate. I'll leave you to it. Good luck. Thank you. OK, John, go for it. Warning, 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 extreme danger, clear the area. As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. <laughs> Magnificent. And I think that concludes today's experiment. There is, I should say, one more, even more reactive metal, francium. But for some reason, they wouldn't let us have any of that. Still, so, there you go. Today's lesson. Never mixed alkali metals with water. So one of the trends that you may have seen in that last video is when they tested lithium, lithium had a very mild reaction in water. As you move down the periodic table to the bottom, they had an increasingly more violent reaction. That's because reactivity will actually increase the closer you get to the bottom of the periodic table. It will also increase as you get further to the left side of the periodic table. So if we look at that, the most reactive element on the periodic table is this one right here, which is the one they were talking about at the end of the video, francium. And um, it's highly reactive, highly radioactive, and they weren't able to test it. The last one that they tested was rubidium, or excuse me, cesium, and that's the one that completely destroyed the bathtub. As you get closer to the right side of the periodic table, family 18, they get less and less reactive. In fact, noble gases, which is what I want you to label family 18 with, noble gases are the most stable elements on the periodic table, and it's because of the number of valence electrons they have. They're very stable, they're very non-reactive, and um, they are 
very easy to find in their pure state in nature. So you're going to find pure helium that would, we would use in a balloon. Um, and neon is commonly used in lights for advertisements. Um, check out this really short little clip. It's going to show you what the different colors of these elements will look like when you pass electricity through each of the elements. It would contain colorless gases in glass tubes, but if we apply a voltage across them, they all light up with their characteristic colors. So you have helium at the top, neon, this bright sign, this is what we see in uh, advertisements and so on, but argon, krypton, and xenon. So each of these gases gives a very different color. Each of the elements. Well, actually. All right, so now we get into the different categories of elements that we have on the periodic table. So the largest of these categories is the metal category. And notice, even though helium is right here, or hydrogen, excuse me, is right here, it is not consider considered a metal, even though it's on the metal side. But metals on the periodic table are the vast majority of the table. They take up the most space because there's more metals than anything else. Metals um, have very distinct characteristics. Um, then you have what's called the metalloids, which sit on this stair-step line on the periodic table. And then we have the non-metals here in yellow. Go ahead on your periodic table and section off these groups and label them metals, non-metals, and then your metalloids. So now let's review the properties of each of these sections. So the metal section, that section we colored in blue, um, and if you haven't already done so, go ahead and color code it. Um, that metal section, they have characteristics like being shiny, um, being malleable. Malleable means that you can bend them very easily and they don't break. They are typically good conductors of heat and electricity. That's why we use metal pots and pans on the stove. That's why we use metal wiring. Um, if you cut open a wire, you'll notice it's typically made of copper, and that's because it's a very malleable, very good conductor of heat and electricity. They also tend to have a very high melting and boiling point, meaning you have to get them very hot before they'll ever turn to a liquid, and then you have to get them even hotter before they'll ever turn to a gas. The only metal that is liquid at room temperature is mercury. Um, and the rest of them are going to be solid at room temperature. Then you have that red section in the middle on the stair step line. These are your metalloids. Metalloids, they're kind of the ones that don't really know where they fit because they have properties of a metal, but they also have properties of a non-metal. For instance, you can have a metalloid that is very, very dull but can conduct electricity very well. Um, you have, for instance, silicon. Silicon is used a lot of times in computer chips. They can conduct information and electricity very easily, so they are used in, in computers. You can also, though, have a metalloid that does is very shiny but is a very poor conductor of heat and electricity. So they kind of have characteristics of both. They don't fit really on either side. The last section is the non-metals. This is a fairly small section compared to the metalloids. And the non-metals, they are very dull. Um, they're going to be brittle. They break very easily like this sulfur in the picture. Um, they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. They're often used as an insulator. And insulators don't allow heat and electricity to travel very easily. So this would be like the plastic that you put over the metal on a wire or the insulation that we have in the walls to keep your house cold in the summer and warm in the winter. They don't conduct electricity very well, so they're serving as good insulators. They also... About 70% of these are going to be gas at room temperature, like the noble gases. And because of that, they have a very low melting and boiling point. Um, 
and that just means that you have to get them kind of cold before they turn into a liquid and then even colder before they'll turn into a solid. So the last thing that I want to talk about is the valence electrons and the valence electrons um, are organized, help organize the families. We mentioned that when we talked about families. And what I want you to do on your table is draw triangles at the top of each of the families. You already have them numbered. Draw triangles and number them. So family one has one valence electron. Family two has two valence electrons. Family 13 has three, 14 has four, and so on until you get to 18. There is one exception on this table, and that is helium. Helium, even though it's in family 18, it only has two valence electrons. Okay, so even though it sits over here, it sits there because it's still very stable. So it acts like a lot of the elements in that family, but it only has two valence electrons in its ring. So just kind of keep that one in mind. It's the one exception that you'll find on the table. So this is kind of our conclusion of the periodic table. And we'll spend some more time over the next several weeks talking about the table and referring to it. But this is just an intro of the basics. So we talked about families and groups going in the vertical columns. They have the same number of valence electrons. They behave in a very similar way. We talked about periods, the fact that they go across the periodic table from left to right. They have the same number of rings on their atom. We talked about metals, nonmetals, and metalloids and their characteristics. Keep in mind on number five on your essential questions, you do have to include all of the properties of the metals, the nonmetals, and the metalloids. Thanks for watching, Bengals. We'll see you in class.